If you haven't watched the first part of this four-part opening episode, make sure to click the annotation card here in the top right to not miss the beginning. After the success of Super Mario 64 on the Nintendo 64, Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi and series producer Shigeru Miyamoto were relentless to replicate the success of their first foray into the 3D scene. However, after the Super Mario 128 GameCube demo turned into Pikmin, it was up to Yoshiaki Koizumi's water pump idea to surpass or falter with Super Mario Sunshine. What nobody knew back then was that the spherical platforms would doom the open-ended 3D space and eventually bring the entire series into space. Summer 2002 stood in the sign of change at Nintendo's headquarters in Kyoto, Japan. First, on May 31st, President Hiroshi Yamauchi stepped down after running Nintendo for 53 years. His appointed successor, Satoru Iwata from HAL Laboratory, would heavily change the philosophy of the company from hardcore to casual in an unmatched stride to appeal to all age groups. Ironically, the first title to launch under the new president was one of the toughest Mario titles since the Japan-exclusive Super Mario Bros. 2. Super Mario Sunshine was a much harder game than Super Mario 64, but received critical acclaim for the wide variety of moves, improved gameplay, the creative implementation of Flood, far better camera controls, and the fresh setting of Isle Delfino. Still, Sunshine wasn't flawless as the opinions surrounding the inclusion of Flood and even rideable Yoshis were strongly divisive among gamers and critics such as Jeff Gerstmann, who described the two as mere gimmicks in his GameSpot review. Super Mario Sunshine would never reach the craze of Super Mario 64, with 6.3 million copies sold to date but still scored 92 on both Metacritic and game rankings, in part because of the new Mario action stages. These combined with the spherical nature of the Super Mario 128 demo and the stars and hub world found in Super Mario 64 would be instrumental in the development of the next 3D title. Surprisingly, shortly after the completion of Super Mario Sunshine, in 2003, Nintendo EAD expanded their operations with an office in Tokyo. There, Mario director Yoshiaki Koizumi was transferred from Kyoto to work on Donkey Kong Jungle Beat with producer Takayo Shimizu. This corporate move would, in effect, result in a two-year hiatus from 3D Mario development and led series creator and producer Shigeru Miyamoto to remake Super Mario 64 for the launch of Nintendo's new handheld, the DS, in 2004. When work on the next 3D Mario finally started in early 2005, the development of the game was entrusted to EAD Tokyo, which led to a number of changes in the Mario team. First and foremost, Takashi Tezuka was replaced by Takayo Shimizu as co-producer and Shigeru Miyamoto would work and input from Kyoto with occasional visits to Tokyo. This quickly led Shimizu to take greater responsibility with securing the flow and work environment of the project which started as an expanded idea of producer Miyamoto's and director Koizumi's obsession with the spherical platform from the Super Mario 128 GameCube demo truly to life. This dream would turn much harder to realize as the project was obviously destined for a brand new piece of hardware, the codename Revolution, later named Wii. If that wasn't enough following the challenging nature of Sunshine, President Iwata asked for a 3D Mario game approachable for the general public. Yes, casual gamers from 5 to 95 years old. In the Iwata Ask session prior to the release of Super Mario Galaxy, director Koizumi reiterated some of the stress faced, how he struggled to visualize the finished spherical platform concept technically to the Tokyo team. In fact, he often saw himself in this situation as, quote, the cook 
First, I showed the recipe to everyone, saying, I want to make a kind of dish like this on Wii, but nobody in the staff was able to imagine the finished plate. Luckily for Koizumi, there was one person back in 2005 who understood his concept. That was none other than Mario creator and series producer Shigeru Miyamoto, who gave feedback from his office in Kyoto. Even so, the staff in Tokyo still struggled to comprehend this dish, so Koizumi-san decided to make a prototype to illustrate. Quote, Miyamoto-san did tell me, though, that this looks good. However, almost everyone on the staff told me how they couldn't make a dish of this grandeur. Hearing that, I felt the need to make a sample plate. Gathering several staff members, we created a prototype that took about three months to make. A spherical shape would be best understood as a planet, so we put that in outer space and added gravity. It looked just like a bare minimum version of the current Super Mario Galaxy. That's where the development really took off. Still, the development of Super Mario Galaxy was filled with differences in opinion between Koizumi and Miyamoto as to game design decisions. But this exchange of arguments and explanation of ideas turned Super Mario Galaxy into the masterpiece we know and love today. In this new external producer role, Miyamoto became the chief tester. I will say he received new bits of the game from Tokyo to his office and home in Kyoto and instructed the team on what alterations, or upended tea tables, had to be applied. Quote, Shimizu-san. So, even on days off, I received emails from him asking, let's change this to that, at very early in the morning. Though we were working at distant locations, I really didn't feel like we were working so far away from each other. We even had a setup where the game that was being worked on in Tokyo would be accessible in Kyoto at the same time. Also, I was really grateful that towards the end of the development cycle, Miyamoto-san often came to the Tokyo office. Since the game was to be easily approachable for all future Wii gamers, the utilization of the Wii Remote and Nunchuck was crucial. This simplified thought process would cause the Mario to the implementation of Mario's spin attack and the reduced emphasis on the jump button. Koizumi explained this more thoroughly in the official Iwata Asks interview. Quote, I wanted to limit the number of buttons you used in this game to two. Typically, Mario's basic action is the A button jump. However, on a spherical map, it's pretty difficult to try to and jump and stop on an enemy. So we made a new move for Mario, the spin. With this move, you're able to tell the distance from the target even when the camera is looking straight down from above, making it easy to defeat enemies. This way, the gameplay has become more intuitive, even for those people who usually don't play video games. The approachability was key for the development team, and this went deep into the design of the different galaxies, where some of them would even take emphasis of the built-in motion controls in the Wiimote. By doing this for these special stages, EAD Tokyo could set up a less gimmicky control scheme for the large majority of the galaxies. Even so, they didn't forget about their goal to create a game for everyone, even those who might be unfamiliar or not skilled enough to play first fiddle. This resulted in the implementation of the simple but still unique CoStar two-player mode. Further, more save slots were added, and finally, an orchestrated masterpiece by Koji Kondo and Mahito Yokoda. Super Mario Galaxy's soundtrack was the first orchestral arrangement composed for a Mario game, and it definitely made an impact. Even the sound effects would sync with the music and offer a whole new level of immersion. When Masafumi Kawamura took advantage of the Wii Remote's built-in speaker, the orchestral piece was handcrafted to a much more linear, story-driven, deeper, and lore-filled 3D Mario galactic adventure. Starting in the Mushroom Kingdom, the player would quickly, after Peach's kidnapping, be introduced to the Lumas, Stars, and Power Stars, the Planet Observatory Hub World, the Galaxies, and finally, a new star in the Mario universe, Rosalina. Rosalina was a different character than the stereotypical princesses or damsels found in traditional Mario games, as she with her reflected complex character and optional personal story offered a much deeper and tragic backstory than anything seen in prior titles. If the inclusion of Rosalina wasn't enough, for Super Mario Galaxy, they would bring back a playable Luigi upon collecting all stars in the game. 
despite teams working relentlessly in both Kyoto and Tokyo to finish the game. The sheer size of the project and debugging involved resulted that the game couldn't be ready for the Wii's launch in the fall of 2006. Still, Nintendo President Satoru Iwata and Nintendo of America President Reggie fils May needed Super Mario Galaxy at their upcoming E3 2006 presentation. After one and a half years in development, the long-awaited reveal was finally a fact with the teaser and demo out of this world. Without any doubt, Super Mario Galaxy, along with Twilight Princess and Wii Sports, stole the show that year. The Tokyo team could return back to work with confidence, and as it soon turned out that even a spring launch, despite a mass hiring of game testers, was too soon to solve all remaining technical hiccups. As such, Super Mario Galaxy became the main showcase at Nintendo's E3 2007 presentation. Two years after the first prototype with the Spheric platforms, Super Mario Galaxy was complete and ready to take the world and Nintendo Wii by storm. The game appealed to both young and old, experienced and inexperienced, as the game had been perfectly designed to be easy for beginners but challenging for experts when they reached the Purple Coin missions. With an aggregated score of 98% on game rankings, 97 based on 73 reviews on Metacritic and numerous Game of the Year awards, Super Mario Galaxy was quickly considered as one of the best games ever made, where the incredible creativeness and introduction of low-gravity gameplay was highly acclaimed. More so, the game was a great commercial success, with 11.4 million copies sold worldwide, and with review scores and reception like this, it was just a matter of time before a sequel would be under development. This would be an unprecedented move, as no 3D Mario game had been followed by a direct sequel reusing the same game engine and physics. This changed when Shigeru Miyamoto, right after the completion of Super Mario Galaxy in late 2007, approached director Koizumi. During this exchange, Miyamoto-san suggested that EAD Tokyo reuse the costly Galaxy engine as foundation for the next 3D Mario title. Though Koizumi was a supporter of this thought, he knew that in order to convince an exhausted Mario team, he had to approach them from the right angle. So he did this, quote, When we got together to evaluate the experience of developing Super Mario Galaxy, I put in a request. I said I wanted to look back and talk over what went well rather than what went wrong. Everyone had lots of positive stuff to say, like, we did this all right, but it could have been better if we'd have done it a little more like so, and it's too bad we couldn't use that one idea, but it would have been great if we could have. I was like, good, good. So I took those responses and consulted Miyamoto-san about this project, and he said, why not just make Super Mario Galaxy 1.5? Upon hearing this, the team at EAD Tokyo had a better idea to create a brand new game, premise, and galaxies from the ground up and only reuse character models, the physics, and the game engine of the spherical platforms. And so started the development of the successor to Galaxy, with former director Yoshiaki Koizumi as the new series producer. He, in a stroke of genius, brought back Takashi Tezuka into the producer chair and finally, Koichi Hayashida as the new director for the game. With a restocked deck, in early 2008, Nintendo EAD Tokyo set out to do the impossible, create a sequel that was better than the original. The first step in this process would be to battle negative thoughts, but all the great ideas had been already used in Super Mario Galaxy and rather look at things bigger, better, and brighter. This way of thinking got producer Koizumi to lift up the greatest scrapped idea from Galaxy 1, rideable Yoshis. But that, my friends, will be told in the next part of Nintendo history, the history of 3D Mario. To all of you, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw, then please like this video, and if you haven't already subscribed to the Commonwealth Realm and turn on notifications, this bell, to not miss the third part next week and the fourth and final part of this opening episode which comes at the launch day of Super Mario Odyssey. We also want to remind that Nintendo history is financed fully through our patrons and in particular Royal Producers Transcendent Sacred Courage and Kenyatta Ali. Truth be told, this is our most expensive endeavor to date and we need your support and backing at patreon.com slash common realm 
to keep this series alive, especially if we want this to remain a weekly series.